evening dear doctors i am zina chauhan from g healthcare on behalf of g healthcare i welcome you all to another clinical episode on our xp connect webinar education series powered by volison technology from g healthcare today we have with us one of the best speaker in the field of fetal medicine dr bimal sani he is a medical director and the consultant radiologist at sonoscan center arangabad he is currently uh, heading uh, positions as a president elect for society of fetal medicine he is a academic program coordinator and main faculty for scholar md structure training program in fetal medicine he is also a president for marathawada chapter of society of fetal medicine his field of interests are fetal growth and doppler fetal cardi echocardiography and the fetal medicine he is also a coordinator for arangabad birth defect registry he has uh, he is a principal author for first trimester guidelines of society of fetal medicine and he has co-authored the second trimester guidelines of society of fetal medicine and society of fetal medicine india oriented guidance statement for ultrasound establishment during the covid 19 pandemic this is a brief introduction to sir uh, there are many more things that he does he is a very good teacher uh, now i would like to invite dr bimal sani to begin his talk on fetal git obstructions over to you sir yeah thank you i am sh uh, sharing my presentation now yeah can you see the screen now zinat yes sir yeah okay and you are able to hear me i'm yes, sir. audible yeah okay loud and clear sir uh, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to yet another interesting educational program from viproji and uh, at the very onset would like to thank uh, zinat and the complete uh, team of uh, g healthcare for giving me one more opportunity to come and address you all and uh, we've had this few months which have been full of webinars full of education material full of panel discussions there's been so much on cardiac so much on uh, the fetal brain and uh, hence when zinat uh, told me ki sir would you like would you take something on the fetal git and that was one moment i really felt yes this is something which actually has been overall uh, neglected in the last few months so let me take something on the fetal gi obstructions now gi obstructions require special care and attention why because they account for 8 to 12% of antenatally detectable anomalies the prognosis great is greatly modified by associated anomalies and chromosomal abnormalities and lastly an antenatal diagnosis and early neonatal intervention can improve the outcomes now it has been found that the post natal surgical management is far better the outcomes are far better when an abnormality is detected prenatally now what is there in our armamentarium you know as far as gi obstruction is concerned yes we have ultrasound mri is fast catching up and then there is something called the amniotic fluid analysis which i will talk to you uh, later a, a bit about that but uh, you know what is the role of mr that is coming in it looks very promising at the moment yes you know these are all it's you know, there are uh, you have case studies a few cases here and there it looks very promising because of two reasons that meconium see what are we uh, as far as gi obstruction is concerned there are two things that we really are bothered about is that fluid in the lumen and uh, in a dilated lumen and meconium now meconium you know gives a hyperdense signal on the t1 w sequences and the fluid content in the bowel is seen on t2 w sequences 
and hence uh, you know mr can with the, because of these features can be used to determine the bowel function and patency all these things can be evaluated by mri but then as of today yes uh, you know it's a problem solving tool at times the cost factor comes in so primarily everything that is being done is being done on ultrasound and yes our diagnosis as far as gi obstructions is concerned has definitely increased since the time we've got better technology that is coming up so there were things that we always felt like the fetal anus you know about 10 years back we said that yes you know we cannot uh, see the fetal anus or uh, uh, anal atresia cannot be picked up prenatally but since the time uh, thanks to these companies and their r&d they have come up with wonderful fantastic machines which have come in the high frequency probes that have come in the c2-9 which i you know which is the one which i use mainly now all these things actually have helped us in improve our diagnosis i'm not saying see gi obstructions is something which actually uh, has a lot of in, uh, limitations as far as prenatal diagnosis is concerned but yes but over the years we have really really improved as far as uh, a prenatal diagnosis of some of these gi obstructions is concerned now there are two things that you have to be uh, you know there are two words which i say one is subjective now as far as gi obstructions is concerned the size of the tract such as the size of the stomach the size of, now and when we talk about dilatations it's mainly subjective see there are objective data available we have normograms for everything available but because the intestinal tract the complete tract is something where it depends a lot on the swallowing how much fluid is coming in you have most of these structures which would fill which will empty hence you know even if you want to go for an objective analysis you want to have a quantitative uh, uh, measurements of things it may you know it all depends at what you know at that moment what is the fetus uh, uh, doing you know and at that moment like if i talk about the fetal stomach the fetal stomach must have just emptied hence so it's mainly a subjective thing that which actually catches our eye and second most important word that you one which is required as far as making a diagnosis of gi obstruction is that persistent so whatever you say you say the the stomach is small the the it always has to be persistently small so you because there you you may see a stomach which is small and you see after half an hour the stomach may fill up so uh, you may you know you may see a lot of transient uh, things that you may in fact sometimes see a small double bubble also taking place you know you have a small fluid coming into the duodenum when the the stomach has just emptied and that is the time you are scanning and hence for ev for any you know when you talk about a pathology when you say that this visceral structure this bowel structure is dilated or small then it has to be persistent so these two uh, the word persistent is something that has to get into your mind and you always and even when you write down in your reports you have to say that there is a persistent non visualization of the stomach persistent in, does not mean that you have just done it over a period of 10 minutes you have to give it ample time at times you have to tell the patient to wait for some time have a cup of coffee come back then take a look again at times you may have to call the patient again after 2 to 3 days and see so that should never be a botheration see it is not that you have taken the patient you got the probe in your hand i have to finish this scan see most of the cases which come to me for a second opinion coming for a non visualized stomach actually by you know when they come to me i find the stomach to be very well filled so the only reason that uh, you know it that was documented was because uh, the person who had scanned didn't have the patience to wait and take a relook again but just imagine that you say that the fetal stomach is absent and then uh, you know some uh, brilliant person says oh this is esophageal atresia and just imagine if the uh, pregnancy gets terminated because of that and hence the you know i'm beginning my talk with 
one very important message that anything that you talk on GI obstruction, whatever you see has to be persistent. Then we have uh, polyhydramnios. Now polyhydramnios is something, uh, whenever you talk about what are the signs of any GI obstruction, uh, especially the upper GI obstruction, it's always said, okay, uh, uh, you know, absent stomach with polyhydramnios, small stomach with polyhydramnios, double bubble with polyhydramnios. Now, so the whole idea is, yes, polyhydramnios is, you know, is something which actually gives you the first clue that there is a possibility of a GI obstruction. Very, very true. But polyhydramnios is not something which will occur in all kind of GI obstructions. Polyhydramnios may not manifest at the 19-20 weeks uh, scan that we do. So the polyhydramnios is more pronounced only in upper GI obstructions. So the, uh, you know, the, the crux is that higher the level of obstruction, the earlier polyhydramnios will manifest. And lower the level of obstruction, the later polyhydramnios will occur. So that is something. So we don't expect polyhydramnios to occur in anal atresia. You know, it may, but it may not. But yes, upper GI, uh, you know, the esophagus, uh, the esophageal atresia is an upper obstruction, so you get uh, polyhydramnios the earliest. And this happens because of atresia and vascular compromise. This results in bowel distension. And because of that, there is reverse peristalsis and vomiting. And all these things lead to uh, polyhydramnios. A normal fetal GIT, normal esophagus is... Uh, honestly difficult to image. We used to find it, you know, we uh, a few years back we never thought that we would be able to see the normal esophagus. But yes, now you can make out the normal esophagus in the upper mediastinum, you know, you can see at times. And then even when we are looking at the four chamber view, we do see, because it all depends, because if that time you are fortunate and the fetal sw fetus swallows and you will be able to see the uh, esophagus. Now, fetal stomach is visible and should be seen sonographically from 11 weeks gestation. That is uh, something which is uh, important. That is something which we can see and that is the fetal stomach is something right from your 11 week scan, you always need to document the fetal stomach. Small bowel is seen from 12 to 14 weeks as an ecogenic mass in the midline. By 18th week, the peristalsis can be seen. Now, the normal internal diameter of a small bowel is less than 5 millimeter and the maximum single segment length is 15 millimeter. What I'm trying to say by the single segment length is because small bowel is a very, very curved structure. So, uh, a maximum single segment that you would probably see would be not more than 15 millimeter. If you're seeing it more than 15 millimeter, because that kind of a spread is only going to occur when it is dilated. The large bowel, the size will increase with gestational age. It's usually 3 to 5 millimeter at the 20 week scan. It can reach 20 millimeter at term. In the late third trimester, of course, anything more than 23 millimeter, we get more uh, worried about it. And the appearance of the large bowel varies with gestational age. At 24 weeks, it is tubular cystic. At 30 weeks, you will start seeing internal echoes. 36 weeks, you start seeing hostations and in post dated, you have an ecogenic uh, bowel that will be seen. So, what obstructive lesions are we talking about? We are talking about, so depending on the level, we are talking about esophageal atresia. We will speak about duodenal atresia stenosis, make a brief mention about pyloric atresia, Jejunal, ileal, secondary to vascular insult, and colonic obstructions, Hirschsprung disease, anorectal malformations, and colonic atresia. So, esophageal atresia, the, you know, it's a spectrum of congenital anomalies, which by the lack of continuity, this happens because of lack of continuity of the esophagus with or without the presence of one or more abnormal connection with the trachea. So, you have esophageal atresia. It can have different type of connections with the uh, trachea. And so, there is a presence of a tracheoesophageal fistula. Now, that is something which we have to bear in mind, which I'll show you because now the esophageal atresia is seen in 1 in 3000 live births. There is no known pattern of inheritance 
and it has a strong association with other findings. Now there are different types of esophageal atresia. Now the commonest type is the type C actually. The commonest type is the one where you have a distal tracheoesophageal fistula where you have, you, that's the proximal esophagus, that's the distal esophagus, it's a distal esophagus which is, you know, which has a fistulous communication with the trachea. You can have, uh, of course, uh, with no tracheoesophageal fistula, you can have the upper part uh, communicating with the trachea or you can have both the parts, come, but these are all very, very rare. But the commonest one is the one where you have a distal tracheoesophageal fistula. Now that actually makes the whole thing very, very difficult because uh, now okay, I, when I come to the uh, diagnosis, I'll talk about that. Esophageal atresia, uh, what all we have uh, for diagnosis, ultrasound, which is actually operator dependent, can be nonspecific, MRI and amniotic fluid analysis. Now there is one more entity which I, you know, uh, for the physiological perspective, you have stomach, which should be seen by 11 weeks. A significantly distended stomach gives you some reassurance that there is a patent upper tract. Okay, so when you see a dis you know significantly distended stomach, it gives you you know some kind of a reassurance. It, a fetal swallowing contributes very little to amniotic fluid dynamics before 18 to 20 weeks. So. What on ultrasound, what are the parameters that we talk about? What are the diagnostic points that we talk about? And the, the most important thing which you will come in, you know, into perspective is an absent or a small stomach with polyhydramnios. So if you're persistently not visualizing a stomach or persistently if the stomach is small and there is polyhydramnios, these are indirect signs of esophageal atresia. Or, you know, you can have polyhydramnios with fetal growth restriction. Again, you have, you know, uh, there can, you know, FGR is present in about 30 to 40 percent cases of esophageal atresia. Now, that happens because of, you know, abnormal absorption of proteins. Then you can have two direct signs. One is the dilated proximal pouch and second is the dilated uh, hypopharynx. In cases where you have both duodenal and uh, esophageal atresia, you can get a C loop, which I will talk about, and then 50% uh, of esophageal atresias are associated with a single umbilical artery. So, if you, you know, all these things uh, help you in, uh, in, uh, in making you more confident about what you are talking about. Now, remember one thing that visualization of the fetal stomach does not rule out esophageal atresia. Now, I am saying this again and again, the most important reason why this is, is that, uh, you, you know, we may appreciate esophageal atresia later on in pregnancy also. So, if you see a fetal stomach, it does not rule out esophageal atresia. Now, these are certain things that we need to have in our mind because tomorrow if you end up where you have a case where, you know, a baby is born with an esophageal atresia and uh, you know, they, they come back to you with saying that how come this was not picked up. See, you need to be confident about yourself. You know, you go and look into your images, you're seeing the stomach, there was no polyhydramnios at that time, so there's less likely that you could have picked it up. So, you know, this is something which is uh, uh, naturally there. So, this is not something that we can help about. Now, a small stomach. Now, a small stomach can be transient, as I said before, we have to be, you know, it, it should be persistently small, can be seen even without tracheoesophageal fistula. So, we always felt that an absent stomach and uh, is something that you get in uh, types of esophageal atresia without a tracheoesophageal fistula. But no, because of gastric secretions also, you may see a small stomach. And of course, whenever they, you know, in majority of the cases, because it is associated with a lower tracheal fistula, the tracheal secretions may cause an adequate stomach size and hence, uh, you know, you may see the stomach in most of the cases. You may see a small stomach, but again, it's, you know, there is no consensus at present with respect to what should we call as a small stomach. So, 
we will see something about gastric size later on now there is one sign which is called the pouch sign that is the proximal esophageal pouch so that is where you have the proximal uh, the pouch of the esophagus above the level of the atresia there the upper part which actually is dilated and this pouch sign is a more specific finding for esophageal atresia it's difficult to see in most cases that's something you know sensitivity is 62% so it is seen only in about 60% of the cases though the specificity is very high 97% specificity so this is a direct sign which gives you more confidence to say that yes this is esophageal atresia and it is underreported because of two reasons first of all it is seen better only after 26 weeks yeah, there are cases where documented after 23 weeks also but mainly after 26 weeks that is one reason why it is underreported and the second important uh, reason why it is underreported is it takes a lot of time so you know you really have to spend you seeing a small stomach you really have to spend a lot of time because this is something which will be seen only when the fetus swallows so you have to wait with a sac section keep your probe and wait wait for the fetus to swallow and when the fetus swallow that is a sign you will see and the presence of a pulse sign indicates a long atretic gap failure to identify a pouch in the fetal neck does not exclude esophageal atresia as i said it is sensitivity is low it will be seen in only about 60 percent of the cases and hence if you don't see a pouch it does not mean that you you're seeing a small stomach with polyhydramnios you're not picked up a pouch does not mean that this is not esophageal atresia so there you can see uh, of course the, you're not seeing a stomach hair there is in the sagittal section you can see a cystic tubular structure which is happening in the neck region and the proximal mediastinum that is there and actually when you put in color that's another very important point when you put in color you would find that the you know uh, uh, once when the pouch actually is uh, you know the pouch fills and it empties sorry when to the, disturb sir uh, i would yeah. like to interrupt sir can you please adjust your microphone the sound is low Okay, okay. Is that better now? Hello? Yeah. Is that better now? Should I yes. raise the volume? Yeah, you can. I will raise yeah, the volume. Yeah, it's raised. It's it. It raised now. Yeah. Okay. You can carry on, sir, now. I hope I am clear now. Uh, how much yes, have yes. people missed? Was it? No, no, sir. It was little low. Uh, I got the okay, message. Okay, okay. That's fine. That's fine now. Okay. okay. So what happens is when the pouch fills and but there is an obstruction distal to that because there is an obstruction distal to the when the pouch fills then it will fill and it will empty now it cannot empty down so what will happen is it will throw so there would be a vomiting so the when the pouch empties you will find that there is a color flow which is coming from the mouth you will find that there is a stripe of color that comes out that tells you that the fetus is actually vomiting. There you can see. There you are able to see a pouch there. These are very old images. I'll show you some new ones there. And there you can see an proximal esophageal pouch which is actually filling and which is emptying. Then a second important sign is, of course, it, it, you know, it is just recently being talked about and that actually is telling you that, uh, that the hypopharynx, the fetal hypopharynx is distended. So in fact, uh, you know, it, that has to be seen in the coronal section. I, I, I have not, uh, you know, I will show you in one of the cases there, but, you know, I'm showing you a diagrammatic representation from this beautiful paper on the, the distended fetal hypopharynx, a sensitive and novel sign for uh, prenatal diagnosis of esophageal atresia. Now, in fact, it is more sensitive than the pouch sign also. It is more sensitive. Of course, it is less specific, but it is more sensitive than the pouch sign. And in a coronal section of the neck 
what you will see is so that's a normal hypopharynx that you see and it has straight walls or the walls would be concave but if you see that the walls are convex so that is abnormal so this is seen earlier than the pouch sign so very promising we need to work more on that and that is again a image from the net where you are seeing the distended hypopharynx there and it is the same principle which is applied when an mri is done also for a suspected case of uh, uh, esophageal atresia now in this let's see this case you have a transverse section of the abdomen the stomach bubble is not seen there is obviously polyhydramnios i can see a proximal pouch here and now when i play my clip you can see that the pouch you have a proximal pouch which is filling the it gets distended and slowly you will find that it empties so it fills and it empties so that is a proximal pouch and if you uh, this is something which is coming in between okay i i am not able to see my own image there is something there so but if you see up at the neck you will find that the hypopharynx is dilated and the hypopharynx has got convex walls i can't put my arrow there there is some uh, obstacle coming there but uh, i hope you are able to see it without that then when you are so looking you at this you can stop share and reshare it again sir no no it's okay they, you know i think this is there is uh, this small uh, uh, how do i remove this from okay 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 yeah i have been able to do that thank you okay, okay yeah, yeah there i'll play this again just to show you the dilated hypopharynx can you see this can you see the hypopharynx can you see the walls of the hypopharynx the walls of the hypopharynx are convex they are neither straight nor concave which they are normally and you are seeing that these are convex so that is a dilated hypopharynx and then you can see that you will gradually see the proximal esophageal pouch which now at the moment it is empty and then it will fill up and you will get a dilatation there and you see that that's the dilated esophageal pouch now the thing is you really have to you know you really have to try you see uh, there are so many people who would say that okay i have never seen a proximal esophageal pouch actually but whenever you have cases wherever you have a small stomach with polyhydramnios so you need to start from a little higher in pregnancy you start from about you know whenever there is a case at about 30 weeks but you need to spend some time you need to spend some time and then you will be able to get it and also make it an habit to put in color because we don't want see what happens is we magnify the image so much we don't want that one of the vessels of the neck we mistake as a proximal esophageal pouch so there are two important things that it should you know there should be no vascular it should not be a vessel and secondly the vessels would remain of the same size whereas a pouch would increase in size and decrease now if you have a coexistent esophageal and duodenal atresia then you will have a, a closed loop of bowel so you will have a closed bowel loop full of fluid and so you get a c shaped fluid collection in the abdomen and sometimes this can extend even into the chest and that is uh, way, you know when you have a coexistent esophageal and duodenal atresia so ultrasound indirect signs polyhydramnios and small absent or absent stomach again low specificity direct signs pouch sign most reliable sign but less sensitive uh, you you have uh, the the dilated hypopharynx more sensitive but less specific mri high sensitive accurate identification of the pouch sign but the cost is an important entity there and the problem is if i want to compare mri with ultrasound now what happens is if the sensitivity i really can't speak as far as mri is concerned because which are the patients which we are sending for an mri where we are already suspecting on ultrasound so these are already the suspected cases that go there so definitely the sensitivity looks very very high there secondly 
by the time you suspect and all see most of these cases actually are done in the third trimester so anyway we really don't know whether mr can be of any help at the 19 to 20 weeks scan that we are doing that is the time when we do so as far as amniotic fluid esophageal index is one thing which has a high which is highly specific but needs more evaluation now let me tell you a little bit about it though we don't put it into practice there is hardly one or two centers in the world which do it the cost is very very high for this but this looks to be the future as far as because see esophageal atresia is one thing which has a very very low prenatal diagnosis and hence anything that can come which would be more accurate more more uh, uh, you know more specific and more sensitive will always welcome so what happens is you have this gamma glutamyl transpeptidase is an amniotic fluid digestive enzyme fetal swelling initially results in accumulation of the ggtp in the git now this gets released in the amniotic fluid once the anal membrane is released now after the anal sphincter matures these enzymes they are not released they accumulate in the meconium and the amniotic fluid levels are reduced so normally you would have reduced amniotic fluid levels but in esophageal atresia because of fetal vomiting this results in accumulation of the ggtp in the amniotic fluid and then the second thing is an alpha fetoprotein so what has been proposed is that you have an amniotic fluid esophageal index where you take the ggtp and alpha fetoprotein mom uh, you, you know are taken into consideration so an amniotic fluid esophageal index is equal to alpha alpha fetoprotein mom into the ggtp mom and if it is greater than or equal to 3 it is suggestive of esophageal atresia now this is uh it has a good high sensitivity uh and uh, you know uh, you know high specificity but problem is it is not universally available i think only one or two centers in europe which is doing it high cost nearly 200 pounds for that and then it requires invasive testing so it is not a uh, you know it is not something like an mri or an ultrasound which are non invasive things so uh that is invasive so these are the limitations but this is the future it is important that we should know about it when it will come to india when we start doing it is uh something uh, i i cannot predict but because things are happening so rapid and so fast you never know just a few years down the line we would be doing that so what are the limitations of ultrasound as far as esophageal atresia is concerned see i spend a lot of time on esophageal atresia actually speaking because you know that is some you know it's i i have i feel uh the majority of the times uh we ourselves don't know what are the limitations of uh, picking up esophageal atresia and that is the thing which leads to all these uh, issues with the patient uh, when a baby is born with esophageal atresia Law, you know most of our, our clinician friends may not be aware you know everybody expects oh an anomaly scan was done at 19 weeks and this baby is born with an esophageal atresia no because the, the 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 simple question that would be asked to them uh, you know was your scan not done before where did you get your anomaly scan done now all these things but if i forget others even we should be aware that yes there are limitations so 85% of esophageal atresia are associated with tracheoesophageal fistula and diagnosis in these cases is often missed prenatally because fluid can course into the stomach the amniotic fluid volume may not be increased the proximal pouch may not be dilated and the stomach at times may not be really small so i'm talking all negative negative things the positive predictive value is 30 to 70% it is not even that high i'm talking about the higher is only in tertiary centers sensitivity of ultrasound is low and it depends on operator expertise now this is one meta analysis and a systemic review which has come in november 2018 asma khalil and group that prenatal detection of esophageal atresia a systemic review and meta analysis you should always read it keep a copy of it you never know when you land up into a problem this is something that you can show to your clinician friends you can show it to your patient now they it has clearly said that indirect signs have low specificity pouch sign is most reliable but less sensitive and they have clearly mentioned that uh, the prenatal diagnosis of esophageal atresia remains challenging ranging from 24 to 
32% ultrasound is a poor diagnostic tool. Now these, these are things which have come through a meta-analysis where they have reviewed most of the articles which had substantial evidence kept in that. So also the association, 6 to 10 percent association with chromosomal abnormalities, trisomy 21 less. But remember one thing, 50 percent of the esophageal atresias which are associated with Down syndrome are the ones which do not have a tracheoesophageal fistula. So you, you, the ones with where you don't see a stomach, they are the ones which are more likely to be associated with Down syndrome. And then trisomy 18 and uh, is somewhere, you know, you have a higher association, other associated anomalies, overall 50 to 70 percent, uh, CVS 35, GIT 15, uh, GUT you can have, and then vectoral association 25 percent. So it is one of the important constituent of the vectoral association. Prenatal management, yes, stereotype should be offered to the patient and done. Look for associated anomalies. As I said, it's just, just not picking this up because the prognosis also depends a lot on what are the associated findings there. You have, you know, management for preventing preterm labor depends on how much the polyhydramnia eventually happens and no specific prenatal treatment is available. The outcome, if isolated and chromosomally normal, the outcomes of surgery are good if it is prenatally diagnosed. So if, a patient, if the treating obstetrician knows prenatally that there is an esophageal atresia, the baby will be delivered in a tertiary center with facilities for immediate management. The problem happens is if it is they're not aware, the baby swallows, there is, you know, the, there is fluid going into the lungs. Now all those things can make the prognosis poor. So a prenatal diagnosis definitely improves the outcome. Now, what are the other causes? So, a non-visualization of stomach is, uh, or a small stomach, is not the uh, sole right of an esophageal atresia. It can be transient non-visualization, which I talked about. You may not see the stomach in the abdomen because there is a diaphragmatic hernia and the stomach is in the thorax. All those disorders which can cause defective swallowing, like facial cleft, yeah, like neck masses, all those things, CNS malformations, uh, fetal urkinesia, dyskinesia, sequence, all those cases where you have defective swallowing can lead to a small or small stomach or even if there is oligodramnia. So there is not, not, there is not sufficient uh, fluid which is available to fill in the stomach so you may get an absent or a uh, small stomach. Now coming to the stomach size, there are measurements and charts available in plenty. AP diameter, transverse diameter, longitudinal length, gastric volume, gastric area, gastric area ratio. Now amongst all those things, you know, it's mainly a subjective assessment that you go by. It's a mainly a subjective assessment that you go by. Now you have all these charts which are available. Now this one wonderful paper which has come on the gastric area ratio, it's a very old paper. But, uh, you know, they, uh, you take the ratio of the gastric uh, area to the transverse abdominal area and then they have given you the normograms. If the esophageal atresia is less than the 95th percentile confidence, uh, sorry, if, it, if the ratio is less than the 95th percentile confidence limit, it is suggestive of esophageal atresia. If it is greater than the 95th percentile confidence limit, then yes, it is a large stomach more likely to be associated with duodenal atresia. And this is how the area is measured and of course the transverse abdominal area that you measure there. And then you have these uh, graphics. So less than 95th percentile is to, goes towards a smaller stomach and greater than 95th percentile goes towards a distended stomach. Now, if you see a dilated stomach in the second trimester, now there is this study which has actually, uh, you know, the cases of 33 cases of a dilated stomach in the second trimester and their postnatal outcome or uh, their, uh, you know, prenatal assessment, they found out nine had other major anomalies. Five had early signs of duodenal obstruction. So distended stomach out of that at, you know, in, at the time of uh, the, 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 the first time when the distended stomach was seen, there was no signs of duodenal obstruction, but later on there were signs of duodenal obstruction which, which were seen. One of them had a trisomy 21. In eight of them, the dilatation resolved. So if you see a distended stomach, 
does not mean that this is definitely abnormal. In follow-up scans, you may find that the dilatation of the stomach has resolved. And in 11 of them, there was no GI obstruction postnatally. So, you, you don't need to panic with a distended stomach or a dilated stomach. Yes, you need to be a little careful. You need to be careful. You need to follow this up. I have seen cases where in the 19 weeks, the only thing that you find is that the stomach is a little more prominent. And the patient comes back at 23, 24 weeks, you see the second bubble and you are able to make a diagnosis of duodenal obstruction. So that is something which does happen. Hence, we need to be worried about, you know, we don't need to be worried about it, but we need to be watchful when you have that. As far as uh, gastric outlet obstruction, pyloric atresia, stenosis is concerned, you know, the a prenatal diagnosis is not very, very, you know, is very, very difficult, is not commonly done. The, you know, you can have, a, you know, a pyloric atresia can be 1% of the GI obstructions. There is incomplete recanalization of the foregut vascular insult. Its familial occurrence has suggested that it may be an inherited disorder with postulated autosomal recessive transmission as far as pyloric atresia is concerned. You may suspect it in the third trimester where you see a dilated stomach and you see polyhydramnios, dilated stomach with polyhydramnios. And you will also see, I, when I show you a case of duodenal atresia uh, in the next few slides, I will show you how the, you know, when because of an obstruction at the pylorus or the duodenum, you may get a, a retrograde filling of the esophagus. So you may have a dilated and hypercontractile esophagus that all could lead you towards a suspicion of a pyloric atresia. Now we come to the duodenum. The duodenum is usually collapsed, transverse view of the fetal, in the transverse view of the fetal abdomen slightly caudal to the pylorus, you see the duodenum. On transvaginal ultrasound, sometimes a short segment of a fluid filled part of a, of a duodenum may be seen occasionally, but normally we don't see the duodenum as such. Now I'm talking about duodenal obstruction. See, we always talk about duodenal atresia. Yes, duodenal atresia is the commonest cause of duodenal obstruction. The double bubble is actually is telling us about duodenal obstruction, but there could be other causes also like annular pancreas, intestinal malrotation of volvulus, superior mesenteric artery syndrome and all those things. Now, okay, we all know duodenal atresia, double bubble. So, you know, we always uh, think on those lines. So, the is, is, duodenal atresia is the commonest of the obstructive lesions of the GIT. Uh, the pathogenesis is interruption of the blood supply or lack of duodenal recanalization. Polyhydramnios is associated. In most of the cases, you will get polyhydramnios uh, and then you have the classical double bubble sign. So you have a double bubble, you have polyhydramnios, two findings which tell you towards the uh, diagnosis of duodenal atresia. But remember one thing that the second bubble may be seen or the duodenal atresia may be usually diagnosed after 24 weeks. It may be diagnosed earlier also, but usually after 24 weeks. Now, the second bubble, actually the bubble is a wrong word. This, the double bubble has actually come from postnatal x-rays where you used to see the gas filled thing, but the double bubble is a wrong word. So you actually see the stomach and another cystic structure. Now remember one thing, there are other things which can also mimic a double bubble, the second bubble. Now those are a hepatic cyst or a colodecal cyst or an uh, enteric duplication cyst. Now the, the most important thing when you see a double bubble is to demonstrate the communication between the stomach and the duodenum. You need to demonstrate the, if you are not able to demonstrate the communication, that second cystic structure there need not necessarily be the second bubble of a duodenal obstruction. So you need to demonstrate that and that is where, so you have two bubbles seen and you're demonstrating this, that is very, very important there. And there you can see, I'll show you some clips now. That's the, that's the stomach, that's the duodenum. So I'm nicely making out the communication between the two. Now look at, in the same patient, look at the four chamber view of the heart and behind the left atrium, you can see one cystic structure which is filling and emptying, which is filling and emptying. So now this actually is the, uh, what is the esophagus. Now this is the esophagus. There you can see that's the stomach. 
and there you can see the esophagus which is dilated and of course this will fill up so this is actually a retrograde filling which is taking place because there is a distal obstruction and you are getting a dilated esophagus now this is the same thing that you can get in pyloric stenosis also annular pancreas uh, yes you know we've always thought that uh, you know a diagnosis of annular pancreas is going to be very very difficult prenatally and it is very very difficult now it is a band or a ring of pancreatic tissue around the duodenum that typically it spans the descending duodenum close to the vitreous papilla now in 25% it's a complete circle 75% it is partial it accounts for 5% of duodenal obstruction in the neonates now 40% of annular pancreas are associated with duodenal atresia or stenosis now this uh, paper by robert dankovic on prenatal diagnosis of annular pancreas and the reliability of the double bubble sign with periduodenal hyperechoic band so they actually have come up with two findings one is yes you get a double bubble and second is that you would find hyperechoic band surrounding the duodenum so there is hyperechoic band which is crossing over across the duodenum this image is from the paper itself now retrospectively I, I you know after reading this because one of my patients whom i had reported as the duodenal uh, atresia actually postnatally had an annular pancreas also and there you can see retrospectively when i was going through the images i found that yes these hyperechoic bands which are crossing now that these that is the sign of uh, this thing this uh, dr rajesh kamre a friend of uh, mine from mumbai a uh, renowned radiologist from mumbai that's his case where you know he actually uh, in fact there there was not much of a double bubble that was seen but he could demonstrate this hyperechoic band which was seen crossing at the level of the ampulla of vater and this turned out to be annular pancreas postnatally so limitations as far as duodenal obstruction is concerned yes diagnosis can be missed at the time of anatomic survey if performed early in second trimester especially in india where we perform our uh, uh, tfa scans at around 18 weeks to 19 weeks diagnosis can also be missed if the duodenum does not become dilated because it is stenotic rather than atretic so if it is stenotic or when fetal swallowing is in inhibited because of coexisting esophageal atresia you may not find the duodenum which would dilate there and workup and counseling yes 70% have associated anomalies it is a part of 23 syndromes but most important thing is 25 to 35% of duodenal atresias are associated with down syndrome so this is one entity which is a major marker for trisomy 21 and if you see a duodenal atresia this definitely requires an amniocentesis and a karyotype to rule out uh, down syndrome and of course detailed scanning and all will come with everything and you need to counsel the patient then we move to small bowel atresia which occurs because of ischemic insult during fetal development and uh, you can have jejunal or ileal uh, or jejunal and ileal obstructions that can happen there so small bowel atresia you what you're going to see most of the time you'll find multiple dilated bowel loops multiple dilated bowel loops greater than 7 mm in diameter or you may find a single segment of greater than 15 mm in length hyperperistalsis is commonly seen the small bowel atresias generally see it is very difficult to when when there are a lot of dilated bowel loops it is very difficult to differentiate whether it's a small bowel or a large bowel it it is not practically that easy but yes if it is a central location and there are no hostations seen you think in terms of a small bowel atresia polyhydramnios may occur not always there can be presence of intraperitoneal leukogenic material that is meconium peritonitis ascites can be uh, one of the presentations there and 44% have meconium peritonitis hyper the bowel walls may appear hyperechoic and then you you know if usually in the jejunal obstruction you find that the stomach is enlarged in ileal obstructions the stomach is not necessarily enlarged but in jejunal obstruction you do find that the stomach is distended now here you can see that you are seeing this look at the peristalsis look at the hyperperistalsis that you are seeing so this is very very important along with that 
you can see there are you know you can see this calcifications in the intraperitoneal calcifications that is all suggestive of meconium peritonitis there now that's a very important thing see whenever you see intestinal obstruction presence of ascites presence of meconium peritonitis two things are very very important there are two things which actually uh, tell you you know they may spoil the prognosis and there are certain non obstructive causes which may give you the same kind of an appearance but in those cases you will not find the uh, meconium peritonitis you will not find like the the congenital chloride diarrhea I, i will come to that when we come now can you differentiate between a jejunal ileal obstruction not always but okay there are certain differentiating point of course jejunal of course is more common ileal is less common atresias are multiple in jejunal ileal they are usually single but anyway on ultrasound we cannot pick up those you know whether there is a single uh, atresia or there are multiple atresias but the dilatation of loops is marked in jejunal atresia and it is less in ileal atresia the stomach is enlarged here it is normal in ileal ascites is rare in jejunal but it is more common in ileal atresia perforations are again less common in jejunal but more common in ileal atresia and polyhydramnios is comparatively more frequent in jejunal and rare in ileal atresia and associated anomalies actually are more frequent in jejunal and rare in ileal atresia so this is a differentiation that you can get between that and there you can see the stomach is dilated you have a stomach which is distended you have dilated loops of vowel loops there you can see this you have multiple dilated loops which uh, are Uh, seen the the mark the they are markedly dilated you are seeing hyperperistalsis there is polyhydramnios so now that goes in favor of a jejunal obstruction and again another case of the same kind i skip this now look at this distended stomach this patient was sent to me with a diagnosis of a double bubble you know uh, thinking in terms of a duodenal atresia but actually now that actually is the stomach that is the stomach and then when you see the stomach is distended and then you have the the duodenum and then you have the jejunum there is hyperperistalsis and there you see there you can see that there is a small mass which is forming there and when you look into there you can see this this is a uh, a uh, you know a circular lesion which actually looks more like a target uh, kind of a lesion there and uh, one more clipping i will show you there and i will show you the color when i put in color now that that's the advantage of a radiant flow you see it so beautifully there and uh, there you can see that these are vessels which are encircling so there is actually a twisting which has taken place so this is something this is actually a volvulus now this is not a you know you are not getting that uh, classical whirlpool because this is small this is uh, this could be an earlier twist that you see but yes postnatally this turned out to be a uh, you know a, a volvulus at the uh, jejunal level the proximal jejunal level so this is more like a midguard volvulus there and in ileal atresia you may have uh, the, you know uh, dilated loops as i said uh, you know they are less pronounced than jejunal but not necessary and then you would have a lot of depending upon how significant is the atresia you would have a lot of dilated vowel loops that you would see there and this is a case uh, again uh, thanks to dr alpana joshi from uh, mumbai and this is a case again you can see a grossly dilated segment of bowel and a similar mass which i showed you before and this case actually all you know was uh, immediately operated upon because this was late in third trimester and this turned out to be an apple peel atresia type 3 you can see this is whole bowel segment has gone uh, gangrenous now that is the that is that mass that we were seeing that is the twist in the volvulus that was taking place there again in gastrocystis this is another case where you have a gastrocystis you can get intestinal obstruction in there that you just need to be aware about 
Now there are certain times when you get dilated Bowe loops, actually the cause is non-obstructive. So things like congenital chloride diarrhea, congenital intestinal pseudo obstruction, microvillus inclusion disease. Now there you get diffuse moderately dilated fluid loops. It's difficult to prenatally diagnose them. It is difficult, but you know, there is one thing for sure that if you see ascites, if you see meconium peritonitis, then you can practically rule that out. Now, congenital chloride diarrhea is not common in our country, but it's, it's actually a very, very rare thing, but seen more in Kuwait and Finland. Now, there you, you know, so, but if you see that there is meconium peritonitis, if you see there is ascites, then the cause is obstructive. It cannot be a non-obstructive cause like uh, uh, congenital chloride diarrhea. And uh, of course, I have never seen one. I, the, one of the articles actually has shown very nicely that you, you know, take, uh, you know, go and take a tangential section of the anus, and uh, you wait, put in color, and wait, and you would find that there would be a frequent stream coming out of the anus, and that is suggestive of the diarrhea. So even prenatally, the fetus is passing stool and uh, that happens more frequently in uh, congenital chloride diarrhea. Now this case actually was prenatally suspected as bowel atresia, but postnatally there was no bowel obstruction and watery stools and turned out to be a congenital diarrhea. Now, intestinal atresia workup, look for associated anomalies, incidence of aneuploidy is low, so, and, you know, the karyotyping and all is not an important thing there, yes, it can have an association with cystic fibrosis. Fortunately, we don't have that much in India, but yes, in the uh, Western world, it is one of the reasons there. So serial scans are necessary because you want to see whether the bowel diameter is increasing, the interval growth, the amniotic fluid volume and complications can be picked up and the serial scans and counseling is very, very important. Again, this is a mid, uh, you know, volvulus and uh, mid gut volvulus and this thing again, a picture from the net because this was very, very classically showing you the whirlpool appearance that you see in uh, mid gut volvulus uh, there. Now, uh, again, that's, you know, more common when, when you have a malrotation and especially in cases of, uh, you know, situs inverses, if you have the malrotation is common and that is the place where you may get most of these uh, volvulus. Then we come to the large bowel obstruction. They are not associated with polyhydramnias and bowel distension. Uh, the causes could be hairsprings, could be megacystis, microcolon, intestinal hyperperistalsis syndrome, dilated colon with diameter more than 23 millimeter with prominent hostile markings. Now that is something that we take as to say that the colon is dilated. Again, Hirschsprung disease, prenatal diagnosis is not, uh, you may just uh, think on those lines when you see that there are dilated loops of colon with peripheral location, there's lack of peristalsis and hostile markings which actually come late in the third trimester and that time you're not seeing them and then proximal dilated loops can be seen. There can be ecogenic material in the dilated loops and rarely ever you may get a polyhydramnios. So this actually happens because of ganglionosis of a segment of the colon and rarely associated with trisomy 21. Then we move to anorectal malformation, rarely isolated, usually associated with bacterial syndrome, can be associated with so many other things, your caudal regression syndrome, OEIS complex, there's so many associated findings where you get anorectal malformation, then two types, high and low, distended bowel loops, hyperechoic particles in the dilate loop, that is all what we used to talk about before. So as an anorectal atresia is concerned, uh, you know, we live with this, that the prenatal diagnosis is difficult as proximal dilatation is not seen and the amniotic fluid will be normal. But currently, if you see, there are more and more case reports coming, more and more studies which are coming where they are picking up the anorectal atresia prenatally and so what started as, you know, suspicion coming from a dilated distal bowel, which is V-shaped or U-shaped and enterolithiosis. So what you see is a dilated, uh, uh, the, you see a dilated rectum and, uh, and you find that it is filled with ecogenic material or hyperechoic small uh, pellets there, that's enterolithiosis. That actually gives you a suspicion of anorectal atresia. But now, 
we are going more by direct evidence where we are directly evaluating the fetal anus now uh, yes of course uh, uh, that you know this is one more uh, thing that in anal atresia at 15 weeks you may find that there is a this is again from an article you may find that the there is a right sided sigmoid and this is very transient sign and then you have a little dilatation and it disappears at 22 weeks but later on in the third trimester again you start seeing some signs of anal atresia and that is the time you pick up so this could just be a transient finding which actually could be a clue it could be a clue so even if it disappears at 21 22 weeks be careful that you need to look down at the ans directly so fetal anus looking at the fetal anus actually our own uh, dr bhupati is the one actually who made the world more aware that the fetal anus can be seen in every fetus from 16 weeks onwards now practically i find it too difficult lesser mortals like me are not able to do it that early but uh, definitely from you know from 23 weeks onwards you are very confident about it but at the time of your 19 to 20 week scans you can look at the fetal anus and that actually see you what you do is you take a trans tran the tangential section of the perineum so basically you take a tangential section looking at the uh, the the bladder and then you start going down and then you will come to the perineum and the genitalia and then just slide back and you are going to find uh, you know a target appearance where you have an hypoechoic ring with a central echogenic center so you have an hypoechoic ring with a central echogenic center and the hypoechoic ring is the anal sphincter and the central echogenicity is the anal mucosa now please remember please uh, try to hear this properly there are two things here you have the anal mucosa and you have the sphincter now this is of course at 31 weeks and at around uh, 21 weeks this is the kind of appearance uh, that you see yes uh, uh, our high frequency transducers are definitely helping us now this sign is known as the target sign somebody called it a donut sign i don't like to use the word donut for an anus there so i prefer to call it a target sign so you can also see the fetus anus in a longitudinal view and when you you know you from there if you go longitudinal it is seen as a rectangular tubular hypoechoic structure with a central echogenic stripe now this actually image i have directly taken it from the paper so that you know it is uh, because this is more beautifully documented because in practice it try basically try to do it more in the tangential section now when to suspect an anal anorectal atresia now the thing is see people do so much of research and so much of work that they have now made a normogram for the diameter of the fetal anal canal also so there are there is a normogram which is available for that so you know when to suspect an anorectal atresia of course you are suspected from looking at a dilated loop enterolithiasis and all that but direct visualization absence of a fetal anus or anal mucosa anal canal diameter less than the 95th uh, percentile confidence limit now that actually gives you a diagnosis of that now you know there is a high type and a low type now in the high and intermediate type you get this very very classical finding where you are not seeing the target sign at all just a thin stripe is made out in the tangential section so that is nice but there is a low type also this this same hold does not this does not hold true with the low type now in the low type you will either get a small anus so you have the diameter which is less than the fifth centile so diameter which is less so a small anus and more important than that is let me remove this from here and more important than that now can you see this you know you are seeing a hypoechoic circle you are seeing a hypoechoic ring but are you seeing the hyperechogenicity within so in the low type what you see actually is the sphincter whereas the mucosa is absent so 
it is not just look you know you're seeing one good hypochloric thing no the more important thing is looking at the mucosa so central ecogenicity is the one which is more important and that actually gives you a clue about the low type so in the high type fine you will not see this uh, target lesion at all but in the low type you see a hypoechoic ring it is small or then you will find that there is no ecogenic center that you, which you normally see in a normal anus okay i will show you some cases here and there you can see now there you have a dilated distal bowel and you can see this these are the entrolytes now these are the entrolytes that i am talking about these are those uh, hyperechoic pellets that you see because a lot of times these are associated analytresias are associated with the fistulas and there that is why you may have urine coming in that urine along with the meconium leads to the formation of these kind of hyperechoic pellets there and then when you go ahead looking directly at the anus you you will find now i'm going in tangentially you will find that there is no uh, the target sign seen there and that is the postnatal picture of that now this is a, a beautiful case which has been shared to me by uh, one of my friends from pusat in maharashtra dr meenal deshmukh and there you can see because as i said analytresia anorectal malformation in majority of the cases are associated with other things most commonly you would see an association with bacterial you can see in o oeis complex now this is and there you can see an infra umbilical abdominal defect with the infra umbilical mass there and when you put in color you are finding see this is again a, a sign which is called the k angle the k angle which actually has been brought by another friend of mine from delhi dr kavita anija she is the one who and this k angle is from her name the uh, kavita and there she has uh, you know in her article she has shown that you know a normally you have a very acute angle between the uh the the aorta and the umbilical artery and if you find that this angle is obtuse that actually itself is a clue towards an extrophy there and so there you can see that there is a, a acute uh, there is an obtuse angle there and here you can see that the fetal anus is absent there is no hypoechoic target sign seen there this is associated with some spinal problem hemivertebrae single umbilical artery bilateral uh, talipus all things put together that's the postnatal this is a wonderful work up that she has done so that is you know it's not uh, uh, fetal medicine is just not about the metros the fetal medicine you know now you can see uh, pusat is a very small place but the kind of work that people are doing there and it's amazing in fact the such wonderful images and wonderful postnatal follow up i just removed my cases and i asked her to send me this and she was kind enough to uh, give me those images there you can see that's the mevtb seen on x rays that's the cloacal extrophy that you see there and this fetus also had an absent anus there and then that is again whenever there is a colo urinary fistula you get this pellets that i was talking about there cloacal malformations again you have those anorectal malformations associated it's a group group of severe non hereditary anorectal malformation you will have failure of division of the cloaca or urogenital sinus you can have convergence of the genital now this all happens because of the embryological formation when the cloaca you know because it all starts with the cloaca and that is the time this uh, uh, the disturbance occurring there leads to cloacal malformation it's rare one in 20000 live births and on ultrasound what you see is a conical retrovesical cyst which actually so you know you may not see the bladder or a small bladder that uh, you have hydrocolpus then you see a fluid fluid level there it's in the midline it may funnel into the perineum and there is a single septum which is uh, most common thing is a septum that you see there uh, you can have bilateral hydronephrosis and hydroureters renal malformations lower segment segmental anomalies and bowel dilatation now i can't end my talk on gi obstructions without telling you a little bit about meconium peritonitis 
Now, this is a sterile chemical peritonitis due to intrauterine bowel perforation and spillage of fetal meconium. Now, there are four types, fibroadhesive, cystic, generalized, and healed association with cystic fibrosis, intestinal atresia, and polyhydramnios. In the fibroadhesive type, you get hyper uh, areas which are scattered. You have, uh, you know, dirty looking hyper things which are scattered around. They can be associated with ascites, polyhydramnios, dilated bowel loops, or an increased abdominal circumference which can be seen. In the cystic type, so basically what is happening is you have perforations, the, the meconium comes out and then that eventually becomes, you know, uh, calcified and that is what you see. Now in the cystic type, you have a meconium which is, gets accumulated. Once it is accumulated, it has a fibrous wall and then there is a wall which is, fibrous wall which takes place. That gets calcified, so you're seeing a cyst and you can see a calcification around. And so that is a meconium a pseudocyst or you can have primary or idiopathic perforation. Sometimes you just find that you have a few tiny ecogenic areas in the peritoneum. See, most common place is, uh, you know, uh, behind the stomach there. So, or below the liver, you may find few tiny these things. Now, these are something that we really need not worry much about because these happen because of healed perforations. Early stage when perforations have occurred and they have healed, these are the little uh, meconium which has, uh, you know, uh, which has gone out and calcified there. So, there is grading which has come up for meconium peritonitis. Grade 0 is isolated intra-abdominal calcification. Grade 1 is intra-abdominal calcification plus either ascites or pseudocyst or bowel dilatation. Any one is there associated with that. That is grade 1. If it is associated with two of these findings, it is grade 2. And if it is associated with all the features, like you have intra-abdominal calcification, ascites, pseudocyst and bowel dilatation, everything put together, then it becomes grade 3. Now, as the grade increases, the prognosis becomes poor and the need for surgery postnatally keeps on increasing. Ecogenic bowel, yes, you know, when we see ecogenic bowel at 19-20 weeks, we talk about aneuploidy, we talk about infections, and we do think, you know, of course, we, in India, we don't think about cystic fibrosis. But remember one thing, an ecogenic bowel, which is seen in the early trimester, can also be a early manifestation of an impending intestinal obstruction. So you may find an ecogenic, whenever you see an ecogenic bowel, do ask for a follow-up later on in pregnancy to look for. Or, and then when you see an ecogenic bowel and you're seeing a single loop of bowel which is uh, prominent, always ask for a follow-up. Cystic fibrosis, I will just quickly take you through because you should, you know, there, when you're talking about intestinal obstruction, then cystic fibrosis is something we need to know about. It is autosomal recessive, lethal. Uh, we will not get into all those things, but the most important thing is that uh, the incidence is very, very low in the Indians, uh, uh, actually, and uh, the mutation, there is a mutation in a gene where, uh, which is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, that is CFTR. The most common mutation is deletion of phenylalanine 508, F508. So, the gene frequency is 2% in Caucasians, carrier risk is 1 in 25, it is less frequent in Asians and male and female is equal. But what is important is that yes, it can present with hyperechoic bowel, present with meconium ileus. Now 10 to 15% of cystic fibrosis patients have meconium ileus. Uh, you know 10 to 15% of fetuses with meconium ileus have cystic fibrosis. But all patients with cystic fibrosis have uh, meconium ileus, the other way around. So. If there is a fetus with cystic fibrosis, it's got, it will have meconium ileus. But when you see meconium ileus, 10 to 15% of them have, can have cystic fibrosis. See, we need to be aware about this entity. We just cannot say it is less in India because these, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, you, if you know that, yes, this fetus, this pregnancy had cystic fibrosis, if you have got collected the DNA, you've got the mutation there, 
in the next pregnancy right in the beginning right uh, you can do a cvs and get it tested for that particular mutation and you can reassure the parents that yes there you know it is not repeated polyhydramnios is there usually after 26 weeks 50% have gi complications and again one of the features in 50% of cystic fibrosis they say the gv would be absent the gb is absent so that is again one sign that you have for cystic fibrosis so management suspicion on ultrasound refer for genetic counseling prenatal testing there are greater than 1000 mutations geographical and ethnic variations but pcr testing identifies 87% of mutations if both are carriers if mother and father both are carriers then invasive testing for fetus genetic counseling and cascade carrier screening offered to families so gi obstruction you suspect by anything subjectively bowels appear dilated stomach appear distended stomach appears small there is uh, uh, the the colon appears uh, dilated there is enterolithiasis whatever suspicion you need to do a detailed workup look for meconium look for ascites and uh, do a complete uh, workup do a detailed scan lot of these anomalies can have associated this thing do a fetal echocardiography look for cardiac abnormalities for other gi abnormalities there can be a lot of associated here uh, you, you know whatever low may be the prevalence in india but yes this is something that needs to be informed to the patient and we need to think on those lines uh, you or torch in, infections can also lead to this ecogenic appearing bowel counseling is the most important thing there because you need to inform the patient everything when you see a small stomach you need to tell them this can be normal you need to tell them that as the pregnancy progresses there can be polyhydramnios and once polyhydramnios occurs the chances of this being an esophageal atresia increases you need to tell them that that at 26 weeks and later i may be able to see an esophageal pouch which actually would then suggest that there is a, a, a esophageal atresia now all these things information needs to be given yes we you know just but 18 19 weeks just seeing a small stomach and uh, labeling it as esophageal atresia or allowing the patient to terminate the pregnancy just because you could see a small stomach or an absent stomach which actually you have not even made sure that it is persistent is absolutely wrong counseling is important follow up and delivery in tertiary centers is very important and last but not the least a very important point that i need to tell you about gi obstruction is gi obstructions are going to be manifest later if you've done the 19 week scan it is possible that someone else who is doing the third trimester scan is going to pick up or if someone else has done the 19 week scan and the patient has come to you in the third trimester you will pick up so make sure that you see to it that you inform the patient that yes this would not have been picked up at the 19 to 20 week scan very important entity because the moment at 34 weeks you say there is an esophageal atresia this patient runs to the previous person and catches his neck and says why you didn't pick up at that right time so you need to inform all those things and that is why you know and you know i normally do uh, say that whenever most with most of these evolving anomalies anything that you see in the third trimester and the moment you see it don't immediately ask the patient did you get an earlier scan done just take the file go out and see because if you ask that question that means that this could should have been picked up earlier if you say that did you get an early scan done whenever you seen something that would lead to that and once if you say that there is a possibility that the patient may say that yes sir you only did that scan so if that happens then you are in a soup so make sure that all your colleagues because make the patient aware make the clinician also aware that yes this can happen this is something which will be picked up in the third trimester so to conclude fetal ultrasound is the imaging modality of choice in evaluation of fetal gi obstructions most often gi obstructions present with polyhydramnios the upper ones obstructive lesions present with proximal dilatation some of the gi obstructions are associated with chromosomal abnormalities gi obstructions are often diagnosed in the late second or early third trimester and complications due to bowel obstruction leading to bowel distension perforation and peritonitis all those things we need to be aware about so 
abnormal liker may be the initial sonographic clue towards upper GI obstruction. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. It was a very much detailed talk on the gastrointestinal tract obstruction. So I am sure that uh, all our viewers would have got benefited out of it. Uh, so now it's time to take some questions from the audience. Uh, yeah. Shall I, sir? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. So there are qu many questions uh, uh, from the audience. So. Uh, so first question is that uh, how to differentiate meconium ileus from enterolithiasis by ultrasound? Meconium ileus, see, it, 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 it may not be very easy to uh, differentiate meconium ileus because both of them could, would show you uh, a, a distended uh, bowel loop with ecogenic material. Enterolithiasis has a very typical uh, appearance, uh, even though uh, people do say that you know it is again you have uh, ecogenic uh, pellets type uh, material seen in both of them but in enterolithiasis you get typical you know that's the word that is why the word lithiasis comes in that you know it looks more like calculi whereas in meconium ileus you would fee see ecogenic material as such you would see ecogenic material there you know that is the, the only way that you would be able to otherwise even it is difficult to differentiate between a meconium flux, uh, you know, uh, obstruction and uh, uh, meconium ileus also. Okay, sir. Thank you. And uh, so the next question is, can we be able to diagnose an apple peen peel syndrome on ultrasound? No, no, no. We will be able to see what I shown, shown you was uh, that, uh, see the types of uh, the, the intestinal uh, Atresia, there are four types, uh, type 1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, apple peel is the type 3B there. And actually, you see, you won't be able to uh, say it prenatally that this is uh, uh, an apple peel atresia. That's a postnatal uh, diagnosis that has come. The, the question is, how sensitive is ultrasound in picking up mid-gut malrotation with volvulus? Mid-gut volvulus with uh, uh, this thing, yeah. I, I don't have the accurate figure of sensitivity there, but yes, uh, uh, you you know, if you see a dilated bowel, if you see see the primarily what you're going to see is a dilated bowel. And when you, once you're tracing the dilated bowel, then you are going to see, uh, you know, you're going to see that particular, uh, the, uh, what you call the, the coffee bean sign or the uh, uh, what you call uh, uh, you know the the typical sign of uh, volvulus there and uh, uh, then midgut volvulus you know there are certain things that can prompt you to look specifically for that is there is a situs inverses because that is again associated with mal rotations because again midgut volvulus is most commonly associated with mal rotations there. So the next question is, uh, what is the criteria for dilated stomach? <laughs> I think I've already covered in my yes. talk that there is uh, uh, no significant, uh, you know, there is nothing, one particular thing that we can say is the criteria for uh, dilated stomach. But uh, yes, uh, it is subjective. You need to, uh, you know, with over years of experience, when you see it, you know that this is dilated. And secondly, the gastric uh, area ratio is one thing which uh, can be, is the one which you can use as uh, uh, what you call, uh, if you want to have a quantification, you can use that as a method uh, which looks to be more reliable than all the others. Again, there is about the gastric volume also. See, the, the, there's uh, uh, good normograms about the gastric volume which are available. But again, you know, all these things is depends upon, you know, uh, that you have actually measured all this at the time when the stomach was fully distended. So, uh, in cases of an abnormality, yes, because they are distended, they remain distended for a long time, it is easier to say. But whether it's, you know, normal cases, they mean, you know, you may measure them at a time when they have just emptied and that can make a lot of difference. So the next question is also related to that same question. So that uh, 
is the stomach dilated only if it crosses the midline zone? You can say stomach is dilated if it crosses the midline. Yeah, it can give you, you know, if it crosses the midline, it, it, is, it may just give you a subjective clue towards it, but it is not just about crossing the midline, it is also about how is the overall distension. How is the overall distension that is important? Yeah, but once it gets really dilated, yes, it does cross the midline and you see there, you know, so, but uh, that not necessarily would be a factor there. Yeah. So the next question is, uh, what's the normal upper limit of large gut diameter beyond which we can mark as a dilated large bowel? Now, uh, large bowel, yes, uh, 20 millimeter. More than 23 is definitely significant. You know. More than 23 millimeter is significant. That is because that is an upper limit uh, because you know you you get uh, the the in the even up to late third trimester it generally becomes 20 millimeter is what it goes to so uh, you know anything more than 23 millimeter is uh, definitely significant you can use that and so the question is how do we differentiate between anteriorly placed anus also what's the progress is Anteriorly placed? Anus. Anus. I didn't uh, get that question. Anteriorly placed anus is, uh, you mean to say more towards the uh, penile region that happens with low anorectal malformations. That is again one of the signs for that. Uh, but uh, you know, you may not, you will not see that on ultrasound. You will not be able to pick up that on ultrasound. And so the next question is, uh, can we diagnose uh, intestinal malrotation prenatally? Yes, I, you know, malrotation, uh, uh, intestinal malrotation prenatally, you know, yes, when, if, it is, if it's associated with an obstruction, you can diagnose it, yes. I and showed one can... case, yeah. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, sir, uh, next question is, is the ecogenic bubble, since uh, you have also told that ecogenic bubble is a strong marker for Down syndrome, so do you always recommend amenocentesis for the same thing? Who said ecogenic bubble is a strong marker for Down syndrome? It is not a strong marker for Down syndrome. It is one of the soft markers for Down syndrome. Among the soft markers, the strongest is an absent nasal bone or an ARSA maybe or then you can come down to uh, ventricular megaly. Ecogenic bowel has a likelihood ratio of about 1.2 in all. So ecogenic bowel, if there is no other marker, I never recommend, uh, uh, you know, karyotype for Down syndrome as such. Definitely not. Isolated ecogenic bowel, there's, if there's, if there's nothing. And a lot of times that ecogenic bowel could be transient. Most of the ecogenic bowel we are picking up these days is because uh, we, like like G has been selling a lot of volusons with all those uh, wonder, uh, you know uh, uh, wonderful fancy things uh, like tissue harmonics and and especially if you start if you have recently bought a C2-9 Pro remember one thing I also faced that problem when I bought it when you buy it for the first one month you will find all bowels appear ecogenic. <laughs> So you have to be careful. Take an history whether there has been a history of bleeding, if there has been a history of any procedure done before, because if there has been an intra-amniotic bleed, there could be swallowed blood which could also cause the ecogenic bowel. Ecogenic bowel could just be a transient uh, finding. It could be one of the findings for cystic fibrosis, as I said. It could be a finding for uh, uh, infections. It, it is also one of the soft marker, but if it is an isolated thing, yes, if you have this ecogenic bowel associated with an absent nasal bone, two markers, the likelihood ratio increases, yes, then definitely a karyotype would be uh, recommended there. But again, make sure ecogenic bowel, you know, the problem is uh, you just subjectively see that the bowel appears a little ecogenic, people label it as an ecogenic bowel. It's very important that the ecogenicity of that bowel should be either equal to or more than the bone. It is only then that you need to call it as an ecogenic bowel. That is why you should always see that in a section where you are seeing the bowel as well as the iliac bones. 
if you are seeing both in one section then you compare the ecogenicity between the two and also when you reduce the gain when you reduce the gain you will find that the bowel if the bowel remains even after the bone has disappeared uh, because the gain is is being gradually reduced then it is ecogenic bowel so make sure if it is ecogenic but if it is isolated finding no but do ask for a follow up because it can or yes you can ask for a torch test do ask for a follow up because it could you know be an early manifestation telling us that there could be a possibly intestinal obstruction which can occur later so uh, how to suspect tracheoesophageal fistula during an omni scan and follow up growth scan i think i took my uh, 25 30% of the talk on uh, esophageal atresia only but you see uh, first of all with you are talking about esophageal atresia with tracheoesophageal fistula now uh, esophageal atresia without tracheoesophageal fistula is uh, more easier to pick up because you will find that the stomach in most of the cases would be either absent or it is too small those gastric secretions can cause it but it can also have a polyhydramnios it so polyhydramnios with that gives you the first suspicion towards that but when you are talking about with tracheoesophageal fistula so now in the second trimester scan it is less likely that you would suspect it only thing is you are you know you are persistent, persistently seeing that the stomach is appearing small now that is one thing which you just you have to ask for a follow up you need to ask for a follow up and because at that stage you are not going to get polyhydramnios at that stage you are not going to get proximal esophageal pouch so the good thing about the pouch is uh, and the dilated hypopharynx is they would be present even in cases with a tracheoesophageal fistula so they are the only signs which actually can we can you know we can say that uh, because 85% of the uh, uh, the tracheoesophageal fistulas are associated uh, the esophageal atresia are associated with the tracheoesophageal fistula so those become the more dogmatic signs but then they would come later we can't do anything about it Uh, so uh, uh, next question is uh, if you see only a hypoechoic anal ring yeah. can you always commit it as a low anal atresia because in many cases we do see it without central hypoechoic ring so, no no but you you need to be careful you take the diameter of the you know you take the diameter of the uh, anal canal even in a transverse section you need take the diameter there you put it on the charts and see so you're seeing a smaller stomach and you know uh, or you go longitudinal if you go longitudinal you would still be able to make out you will still be able to make out the anal canal and you would be able to make out that hypoechoic uh, space between so uh, but that actually uh, you know you so that's what i'm saying this usually happens when we when when we are doing it early later on in pregnancy it is not much of an issue later on in pregnancy and then look for also supportive things see look for other thing now if there are other multiple anomalies and you are seeing this yes this is uh, you have to give importance to that but if you are finding this only as an isolated uh, finding you give a, you call it for a follow up now in my own practical experience has been that uh, see i did not have looking at the fetal anus as a protocol as a part of my protocol uh, most of the guidelines also do not have that as uh, you know in the tfa guidelines that you have so initially we were we used to look for it only when we used to find something else so if i find that there is a radial ray defect if i find that there is a hemi vertebra then yes for my vector association i used to specifically look for it but uh, now since the last uh, few years you know since the time dr bhupati has shown that yes you can see it in every case since when i started putting it in my protocol uh i spent a lot of time 3 uh, to 4 months in lot of stress because practically in lot of patients i used to doubt that it is not well seen and uh, but you know i i knew that much is not the incidence of that so i never reported it but i called most lot of these patients uh, for a follow up scan later on sometimes even telling them that yeah you come down we'll just take a look and uh, you know just get a referring letter and i'll do it free 
because that much of this thing so it comes with practice it comes with practice and yes you know th this is again a recent thing which they have pointed out that you know either getting a small uh, anal diameter or you seeing a just an hypoechoid so you are basically just seeing the periandal muscular the complex but you are not seeing the mucosa and that actually gives an indication towards that but then now if you are seeing associated uh, dilated uh, loop of bowel you are seeing enterolithiasis then it does help you in making a diagnosis uh, sir the next question is uh, for echogenic bowel should testing for cystic fibrosis be asked for ah uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, if if there is if there is a, there has been a history of uh, uh, bowel obstruction before, if parents have uh, they are carriers or something, yes. But uh, as a routine, uh, we don't ask for uh, that. Definitely, the incidence is very very low. But anyway, if you decide to do an amnio, then you can also do that along with that. If you're doing an amnio for karyotype, then you can do with that. But uh, yes, if it is associated, you see ecogenic bowel and you're seeing associated some dilatation, you're seeing some meconium peritonitis. Yes, definitely, you should, uh, you, you need to do it. Otherwise, uh, as a routine uh, isolated uh, ecogenic bowel, uh, I, I don't uh, recommend uh, doing it in my practice as such. And so the last question now, the, which are the bowel obstructions have poor prognosis? Which bowel obstructions have poor prognosis? Yes. yes. Now, this will all depend upon uh, whether you have prenatally detected or not. Then the poor prognosis not necessarily comes only from the obstruction. The poor prognosis comes uh, because of its associations. Now, when I, when I was talking in, in every uh, uh, bowel, uh, in every obstruction, I said, what are the associated this thing? So, the prognosis becomes more poor when there, see, of course, if it is a, a part of a chromosomal abnormality, then definitely the prognosis becomes poor. If it is associated with other anomalies, again, it will depend upon what, uh, associated with a cardiac abnormality, associated with, now suppose if it is, uh, you know, uh, an isolated anal uh, imperforate anus or this thing without any other problem, then uh, fine, the prognosis will be good. But if it is associated with uh, uh, a cloacal extrophy, if it is associated with bacterial this thing, the prognosis is going to be poor. And a lot of these uh, fetuses with anal atresia would have, uh, you know, because there are fistulas, this thing, the prognosis may not be good. Then uh, you have, uh, you know, as far as intestinal obstructions are concerned, again, if there is an association with cystic fibrosis, the prognosis would become poor. So prognosis is not something you can just say that which obstructions are more dangerous or this thing. It all depends on what are the associated things with that. So with that, sir, the questions are over. Thank you very much for uh answering all the question in so much of details so thank you very much sir and thank and you Zina, like to... and thank you viproji and uh, ge healthcare for uh, this wonderful opportunity and uh, i hope uh, you know all the delegates i could put through what i wanted to and uh, so this was just fetal gi obstructions zenith actually wanted me to take the complete git i would have had to speak for half a day or one complete day if i would have had to finish off with the git thank you thank so, you very much sir. Thank, thank you very much thanks a lot and thanks to the complete team even the back end team uh, the it team thanks a lot for uh, all the help and uh, wonderful display of things and uh, thanks a lot okay can